Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Keith here at Zion United Methodist Church in Myerstown, Pennsylvania with today's Wednesday's Word, and I thank you for watching. And uh, we're going to continue on today with our study in the book of 1 John. And we're in chapter 3, starting in verse 11. So if you have your Bible, you can open that up, 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. And today we're going to look at this issue of love as the evidence of your salvation. Love is the evidence of your salvation. How do you know that you're saved? Well, something happens within your heart. You show this uh, love to those around you. So let's start here in verse 11. It says this, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And so, again, remember what the writer John is dealing with. He's dealing with a church that is very concerned because a group of, of their what they thought were Christian brothers and sisters has spun off. They left this church and they've pursued another way. And it's a heretical way. But uh, they've left the church and now they look at the people who remain in the church and they say, oh, you're not really saved. We're the ones who really understand salvation. We're the ones who really have this salvation. And John is trying to show these folks who are faithful what it really means to be saved. And he gives us these comparisons. Last week we looked at the comparison of righteousness and unrighteousness. And I don't know if you remember, if you watched that video, but a person who was a born-again believer does not continue in unrighteousness and lawlessness, but desires the things of God, desires to live a life of righteousness uh, in the footsteps of Jesus. And today we take that a step further. And actually in verse 10 last week, he says, by this, uh, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And so he begins talking about love as an evidence of your salvation. And so we have this division that he's making, this comparison of those who are saved versus those who are not saved. Those who are saved exhibit love. Those who are not saved, they exhibit hatred. Okay, so you have this comparison of love and, and hatred, love and anger. And so he begins by um, talking about a specific story in the Bible that we're going to get into. He says, um, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. If you're saved, you, you have a new heart. You have a desire to love other people. That word love is the Greek word agape, which is a Christ-like love. It's a, a sacrificial kind of a love. Verse 12, he says, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his right, his brother's righteous. Now Cain, most of you probably know, is a figure from the Old Testament in the book of Genesis chapter 4. And we're going to turn there and look at this story. But you probably are familiar with the story of Cain and Abel. The Cain kills his brother Abel. And you wonder why he would bring this up here. And I read a commentary that said that the Gnostics, the Gnostics were the, the people who spun off and kind of created their own church, the, this heresy. Um, and 
they were the ones who highly regarded Cain. They actually celebrated him and thought he was a hero of the Bible. Interesting enough. So in Genesis chapter 4, I'm just going to briefly look at this story. If you have your own Bible, turn. It's the first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. I just want to briefly look at this story of Cain and Abel. It says in verse 1, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife. Remember, Adam and Eve were the first people that were created by God. They lived in the Garden of Eden. God made them sinless. He made them perfect. Um, he had perfect communion with them until they were tempted by the evil one. And they were tempted to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God instructed them not to eat from. They rebelled against God, sinned against God, and as God promised, that they would uh, surely die because of their rebellion. And he kicks them out of the garden. They begin to start their family here by having children. So it says, she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Eve recognizes that God gave her a son. She uh, celebrates this. She thanks God for um, giving her a son. Continues on in verse 2. And again she bore his brother Abel. So Abel is the younger brother. Cain is the older brother. Then we learn a little bit about who Cain and Abel are. It says, Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. And this is interesting because I think that this is a foreshadowing of what will happen with Jesus Christ. And... Um, I'm not going to get too deep into this, but I just want to share a few thoughts of, of what I see here as I read this story. So it says that Cain is a worker of the ground. He's a tiller of the ground. And if you look back in Genesis 2.15, it says, The Lord God took the man, who would be Adam, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and to keep it. And so Adam was also a tiller of the ground. Cain took after his father, Adam. Adam represents mankind, humankind, um, our nature, who we are. Adam is like the representative of, of us, of people. And the whole package that comes with that, all of the unrighteousness and uh, the sin that enters into the world through Adam, that, that is represented in the, the person of Adam. But it says that Abel is a keeper of the sheep. Okay, so Abel... The younger brother was a shepherd, a keeper of the sheep. And if you think through the scriptures, if you know anything about um, some of the characters in the Bible, there are a number of shepherds through the Bible. There's Moses, there's David, and there's some others. But the one that I want to point out is that Jesus is called a shepherd. And we see in, in John chapter 10 that Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. That um, we are his sheep. Those who are in Christ are his sheep. And that he, as the good shepherd, lays his life down for the sheep. That his life was taken. He was killed. That he um, gave his life on our behalf. Okay? So he, he was killed by, by men. And so you can see the comparisons, how this, this story of Cain and Abel foreshadows what will happen in the future with Jesus, that Abel is a type of Christ in a sense, that he is the one who was killed by Cain, who represents man. Hopefully I'm not looking too much into this, but I certainly see the resemblance of what Christ will do for us um, as recorded in the Gospels. So in verse 3 it says, In the course of time Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. So what's happening here is that they both recognize that God is the one who has blessed them with what they have. And they each take um, what God has given to them and, and offer it up as an act of worship to God. Now, there is a, a major difference in how they go about doing this. It says that Cain takes from, actually the, the word here, it says in the course of time in verse 3, actually means at the end of the day. In other words, he waited basically to the end. 
all right? And at the end of his day, he thought, oh, you know what? Maybe I should give something to God. Um, it was kind of an afterthought to him to give this sacrifice of, of worship to the Lord. Um, and, and it says that Abel gave of the firstborn, the first fruit of his flock. And so he took the first lamb that was born. He, he killed the lamb. He offered it as a sacrifice. He offered up the fat portion, which were the best part of the animal. And so it was the first of what he had. And so God looks at these two sacrifices. He looks at Cain's and he's not pleased with it because he, he recognizes that with Cain, it really wasn't an act of thankfulness. It was almost like he did it out of a sense of obligation. But Abel gave of his best. He gave of his first. That's what God wants from you and me. He wants our best. He wants our first. Okay? And God can look beyond the surface level. He looks beyond what is visible. So he, he looks beyond that and he looks at the heart, the condition of the heart. What are the intentions and the motivations of the heart? And he can see beyond what may have looked like a good offering on the um, part of Cain. But he looks at his heart and he sees that his heart's not right. God looks at our hearts. He knows what motivates us. He knows when we do things out of a sense of obligation. We do things that um, we want to be seen. We want other people to look at us and celebrate us or respect us. And so he sees beyond the surface level into the uh, condition of each of their hearts. And he's not happy with Cain. Cain becomes very angry because God's not happy with him, and yet God was happy with his brother Abel. It says his face fell. Uh, it means his countenance fell. You can imagine, like, he has a great big smile on his face, and as soon as he recognizes that God isn't pleased, that smile just goes away, and he becomes very angry. And it says in verse 6, The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And so you can see the result here. Cain is very angry, and he, is, he calls his brother out into the field. He lures him out, and he attacks him, and he murders his brother. And this is like the, the end result of having this anger in his heart, okay, is, is this hatred he has for his brother, and eventually he wants to kill his brother, murder his brother. And this is, this is a very important story for us. Um, obviously, we don't want to be like Cain. You think, well, we don't want to murder one another. That's pretty obvious. But it's not just the act of murder. It was the condition of his heart. It was the hatred that he had. It was the anger that he had in his heart. Um, we see that in verse 12 of 1 John 3, it says, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one. We see the evil one had been controlling Cain, had influence over Cain in, in the attitudes of his heart and the thoughts of his mind, helped him devise this, put that anger within him. And we have to understand that the evil one is out trying to tempt, trying to control, trying to influence us. And he did it to Adam and Eve in the garden, caused them to sin. He, he worked in the life of Cain, caused Cain to sin. And he's still at work at, uh, in this world today. And each of us, we are either um, of uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, or we are of the devil. We are of the evil one. There is no in-between. There's no uh, saying, well, you know, I'm on my own. We are either under the influence of the Lord Jesus Christ or we're the, under the influence of the devil. And we are called to be under the influence of Jesus, obviously. Cain did not uh, follow the ways of God, and he allowed his anger um, to fester within him, and eventually it turned to hatred and murder. But I want to take it step, a step further because anger is never a primary feeling or emotion. Anger is always at least secondary to something else, typically to uh, a feeling of hurt or of fear uh, or even of sadness, that, that it is out of this hurt or fear or sadness that we then process it and then it comes out as anger, it manifests as anger and then into other really horrible things. Um, 
And I would say in this particular case at the root of Cain's heart isn't just anger, it actually is jealousy. That he looks at his, his brother Abel and he is jealous of his brother. He wants what his brother has. Okay, and, and jealousy is a huge problem, not just with Cain, not just throughout the Bible and in Christ's time and throughout the New Testament, but jealousy is a problem in our lives today too. And it has no place in the life of a believer. And jealousy is looking at somebody else and envying what they have, desiring what they have. And it leads to all kinds of problems like anger um, and greed. It leads to sins like gossip and slander where we feel like we have to put other people down in order to raise ourselves up just to make ourselves feel better. And really at the core of jealousy is a feeling of insecurity. When we are insecure about who we are, when we feel like we don't measure up, we feel like we, we don't have what we should have, you know, we're not as wealthy or as smart as the next person, uh, we feel insecure. And that leads to jealousy, leads to anger, and all sorts of other sins. And so uh, dealing with jealousy, we really have to deal with the insecurity that's in our heart. And the only way to deal with insecurity is through the Lord Jesus Christ, because Jesus is the one who bore our sins on the cross. He's the one who died for you and for me. He's been raised from the dead. And when we have our faith in Jesus Christ, not in ourselves, but in him, he forgives us of our sins and he calls us his child. Okay, so if you believe in Jesus, you are his son or you are his daughter, you are his child. And when you have this standing as a child, that insecurity goes away because you know that your standing is right with God. And it doesn't matter what other people are doing, what they're saying, what they are. Just like God says to Cain, if you do well, what does it matter what your brother does? And so we are called to find our identity, our security in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we find that, we have that security, that jealousy factor goes away. We don't care. We don't feel like we have to measure up to other people. We don't feel like we have to have, you know, the, the best posts on social media to make us look good and have people congratulate us and stuff like that. That doesn't matter anymore because our security is in the living God. It's knowing the love of Jesus Christ. Once you know that love, it changes your heart. Okay, and, and that love becomes a part of you. And then you begin to love others. When you've experienced that love of Jesus, especially what he's shown us in the cross, that changes you and you begin to love others. And so I want to continue on um, in 1 John before I wrap it up here. It says um, in verse 13, Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. This is... Going back to the story of Cain and Abel, this is going back to what Jesus has told us in his word. He says, a, a, a student is not above his master. If the world is going to treat Jesus with contempt, then the world is going to treat the followers of Jesus also with contempt. We are no better than Jesus. Jesus was persecuted. Jesus was killed for his righteousness. Abel was killed because of his righteousness. So when you live a life of righteousness, when you live a life that is in tune with the Lord, you're living a life of love, don't be surprised when other people don't like it. They're going to become jealous of you, just like Cain became jealous of Abel. So he said, don't be surprised of this persecution. Don't be surprised when people aren't happy with your righteousness. In verse 14, we know we've passed out of death into life. That's what happens when, you're, when you come to faith in Christ and you're born again. You're a dead person that comes to life. And that's what we experience. Only Jesus can give that to us. He says, because we love the brothers. This is the evidence of your salvation, is your love. Do you love other people? He says, whoever does not love abides in death or remains in death. And you can tell when a person doesn't know Jesus because they have hatred, they have anger, they have murder in their heart. Um, they, they have that, um, they don't have love for others. Okay, they hold on to bitterness, they hold on to unforgiveness, and we have so much of this in our nation right now. People are angry, they are bitter, and they are using all different kinds of means, um, not, to, not for reconciliation, um, but for revenge. They cry out for justice, but listen, justice without reconciliation is simply revenge. And 
God wants to actually renew us on the inside. He wants to renew our hearts so that we're not filled with hatred. He wants his people to be filled with love. So that is the litmus test. Um, finally, verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And he's not just talking about killing in self-defense or law enforcement or, uh, you know, the armed forces or anything like that. He's talking about murdering somebody. He's talking about hatred in the heart causing murder and not even the, the physical act of murdering, but just being filled with that rage, that anger, um, that that is an evidence that God is far from you, that you have not put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so um, as I wrap this up, I just want to ask you, um, as you read this passage, as you think about these words, contrasting love versus hate, love versus anger, what's the condition of your heart today? Do you carry hatred? Do you carry anger? Do you carry bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness? God wants to rid you of all those things, and he will do that through the Lord Jesus Christ. God loves you. He sent his son to die for you. Put your trust in him. Repent of, of that anger. Repent of that, ang uh, of, of that hatred. And what God is going to do is going to replace that with love. He's going to change you um, because you're forgiven. You've experienced that forgiveness. Um, you're going to learn to forgive others and you're going to learn to love them. So what is the condition of your heart today? Um, I just encourage you to pray to the Lord. Think about these words uh, and get right with him. Um, again, he loves you. He forgives you. And hopefully as you've listened today, this has been a blessing to you. I hope that, um, that this is a, a word of encouragement to you. And it, it helps to feed you and equip you throughout your week. So thanks again for watching. Uh, it's been great having you along. And I hope to see you back here next week. God bless you. God loves you.